Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Victor Mercadente. I'm an assistant professor at Virginia Tech and I'm also a member of the Beef Reproduction Task Force. And uh, we're back with our webinar series on beef cattle reproduction. And today we're, we're happy to have here with us Dr. Joe Dalton, who is a professor and a extension specialist in University of Idaho. Uh, he's a current member of the Beef Reproduction Task Force. He's also a past board member of the DCRC, the Dairy uh, Cattle Reproductive Council. So we're really happy to have him here with us and we look forward uh, to his presentation. I want to remind uh, two things to everyone before we, we start. First is that uh, please use the Q&A tab on, of Zoom to send your questions. And we're gonna try and answer as many questions as we can at the end of the webinar. Uh, and second, um, you know, point, um, bring your attention to the slide that you're seeing now that has all our social media and online presence. We have a Facebook page, we have a Twitter account, as well as a YouTube uh, page where we, uh, all those webinars that we've been uh, presenting and recording are available there uh, for you to view, as well as the past presentations from the Apply Reproductive Strategies uh, in Beef Cattle, which is our annual meeting. Uh, and also our beefreaper.org website who has a lot of information there. Uh, so I wanna make sure that I point that out to you guys. So Joe, thank you very much. And um, we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Vitor. I'm, I'm really happy to really talk about a, a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, I've talked about a uh, wide variety of things I've been fortunate to in dairy and beef cattle over the years, but semen handling is one of the things that I really enjoy. And I hope you will too. Thanks everyone for taking time out of their day and their evening or wherever you are uh, to uh, listen to this. And hopefully uh, we give you something to chew on, something to think about. And like Vitor said, we'd be happy to answer some questions after this. So we're gonna talk about semen handling for maximum fertility tonight. And the outline of our program is gonna go from semen storage to actual semen handling. And that is retrieval from the tank and loading the gun and going to the cow. And then we're also gonna talk about the site of semen deposition because semen handling really covers more than just removal out of the tank. It covers from when you receive it uh, in your liquid nitrogen tank until it's actually deposited in the cow. And that's the, the context in which we are going to uh, look at semen handling tonight. So at the AI Center, I'm gonna get my pointer here. At the AI Center, after bulls are collected and the semen is extended and the semen is uh, processed, semen is loaded into straws. And we can see the straws here and here. There's five straws located on the bottom and on the top. And these straws are, are, are after freezing, these straws are loaded into this goblet. And there's an upper goblet and a lower goblet, which is then attached to this rack or a cane, if you will. So semen is packaged in straws, straws are held in goblets, and the goblet is held by a cane. And this is how then we will manipulate the uh, unit in the uh, storage tank. So here we have a cane that's loaded with two goblets with five half mil straws in the top goblet and five half mil straws in the bottom goblet. Getting to the idea of, of storing semen on, on the farm, we're using essentially a, a, a glorified thermos, if you will, or a, it's essentially a tank within a tank. And what I mean by that is if we can see the outside of the liquid nitrogen tank. What we can't see is the insulating material shown here, that it's directly on the inside of that portion we can see. And then there's actually a smaller inner tank that I'm outlining right now. 
And that smaller inner tank is the tank that's actually going to hold the liquid nitrogen. And that is where we will store the canes of semen in there within the canister here. So the idea is that the factory of, uh, of the liquid nitrogen storage tank, they pull a vacuum on this insulation area, and that helps to keep the liquid nitrogen here within the small tank longer, okay? We have canisters. There can be six to eight canisters per tank, depending upon the size of the tank, okay? There will be a stopper that's usually made of styrofoam that is held in this neck tube. And then there's usually a cap that rolls over to go on top of the stopper, okay? Some things you wanna remember about the liquid nitrogen tank. Although they can be very, very heavy when they're full of liquid nitrogen, they're still a very delicate piece of equipment. And what I mean by that is, we never wanna launch it out of the back of the pickup. We never wanna slide it down some plywood off the pickup. We wanna be really careful with it. And the idea here is, is because if we dent the outside, we can damage not only the vacuum, we can damage the outside, we can put a hole in it. We can also break the neck here. And by breaking the neck, we can have premature release of liquid nitrogen and the potential to unknowingly have the tank go dry. And if that happens, then we run into the issue of having a whole bunch of semen we can't use because uh, the semen is no longer frozen. It's actually thawed, but it wasn't handled properly. It's not gonna generate any pregnancies. So we wanna be careful handling the tank uh, from a standpoint of making sure that we have the best possible container for the longest period of time to guard the investment of what is stored inside the tank. And the last thing I'll say about the, the storage tank is we always want to make sure we know how much liquid nitrogen is in the tank. We can monitor it weekly very easily with a dipstick. We wanna maintain in most tanks a minimum of six inches of liquid nitrogen. And we wanna fill the tank at regular intervals, okay? And you know, with, uh, with smartphones and things like this and being able to put things into electronic calendars, it becomes very easy for the herd manager or the owner to have in their calendar, time to check the liquid nitrogen level, time to call uh, our representative, and conversely, there are even reps that'll have it in their calendar to come by your place to fill up your tank. Okay, so managing the tank, we have to recognize that when we pull the stopper out, that we can have liquid nitrogen in the tank down here, but we have a gradient of temperatures within the neck. And the temperatures naturally get warmer as we get closer to the outside environment. And that just makes sense. So in a tank that is essentially full or close to full, we would see temperatures, and these are in Fahrenheit, we would see temperatures that are close to the freezing point of liquid nitrogen or the liquid nitrogen portion not the evaporative portion. So that's gonna be minus 300 degrees at the opening of the neck in the tank. But notice as we go up from six inches to five to four to three, that it begins to warm. So at about three inches, we're at a, about minus 105, 103 to 116 degrees. And then as we get towards the outside world, here we are, we're at positive temperatures now. If this was in an office and we're talking about office, regular room temperature, regular room temperature is about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can see that the pressure of that 70 degrees is going to cause this 
right in the opening to be anywhere from 54 to 36 degrees. That's incredibly warm, incredibly warm for semen. So, you know, when we, when we learn to perform artificial insemination, we always talk about working below the frost line. We always talk about keeping the canister as low as possible. And why is that? The main reason is, is we know from injury, or excuse me, from research, we know from research that sperm injury actually occurs in this zone right here at about minus 110 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you think of it, that's just crazy. Minus 110 degrees Fahrenheit, but injury actually occurs to sperm at that time. And the important thing to take home is that sperm have no mechanism by which to repair themselves. So injury to sperm can't be corrected and it certainly can't be corrected by returning the semen to liquid nitrogen. So what we wanna do is we wanna work as quickly, as efficiently as possible. And we wanna remember the straw that we're not most focused on relative to sperm injury, it's not the straw we're removing from the tank because that's, that's a commitment. You grab that straw, you've removed it, you've thought it, it's done. It's gonna generate a pregnancy or it's not. It's the other four straws that are within the goblet that potentially could have been injured the first time you raised that cane and then you put it down. And then you raise the cane to pull a second straw out but there's still three straws remaining that have been insulted a second time, and so on, and so on. The injury becomes additive to sperm. So the idea here is we need to focus and pay attention to what we're doing, not only for the straw that we're removing, and again, that's a commitment, that, that one's going into the cow, but it's the ones that we leave in the tank, we also have to manage appropriately. Okay. I mentioned always work below the frost line. That's a great idea. That's the best benchmark that we have. You can see we're looking down the neck of a tank. This is one of the tanks that I have. And we're looking down the tank. You can see this darker brownish uh, portion of the neck here. And then here's where the frost line begins. Okay. Frost line is right there. You can see there's one cane shown here. It's a practice cane. And then I have another cane shown here. Okay, you can see the rim of the canister is below the frost line. Okay, and we can add some graphics to that. That blue is essentially where the frost line is. And here we're looking at a canister that's been raised, but is still below the frost line. And then we're looking at a cane that has straws in it. Okay, how do we manage this? The way we manage this best is, is to use tweezers to keep the canister and the cane as low as possible. And with the tweezers and the angle of the tweezers to exploit that and remove a straw from the top goblet, and while we put that straw into the thaw bath, we're simultaneously with our opposite hand putting the canister back in the liquid nitrogen. Okay? So a lot of things going on, but the idea here is, is we're focused not only on the straw we're removing, we're focused on the straws that remain because we can't damage them because if we do, then the next time we'll damage them again and again and again. Okay, so I've got a couple of slides here that I like to show uh, because these are pictures that were in national magazines or pictures that I, I got off the internet that it's just wrong. And this picture here, this is not a best management practice. Okay, this is this, I saw this in a magazine 15 years ago and I about fell out of my chair. 
And essentially what we have is we have someone who raised up a cane. This portion here is the canister. This is the cane. And there are some straws in the cane. There's another, uh, excuse me, goblet. There's another goblet down here and there's some straws in the goblet down here. Everything I said about the frost line isn't being adhered to here. We've got to work as low as possible. You never want to exteriorize a cane to say, gee, look at this, or, or can I get this, et cetera. You have to do all those types of mental gymnastics outside the tank, where you have an inventory outside the tank. If this person wanted a picture of semen handling, probably better to do it from like a drone view from the top and then try and have a telephoto into the neck. That way you don't break any rules, okay? So this is not a best management practice, okay? This is another article within the last couple of years that this also is not a best management practice. Look at, look at the rim of the neck. This is the outside world. These are the tops of the canisters, tops of the canisters. These are the tops of the canes, okay? Right in there, I can see there's some green in there. It's bad practice, okay? Bad practice. The whole top goblet on all of these canes is above the frost line. And if we learned anything from the first slide or the slide that showed the diagram of the neck, we're talking close to room temperature, okay? So bad, bad practice, don't wanna do that. Okay, so we go out into the field and we have a, a liquid nitrogen tank and we have a stopper and we've got the stopper in there and we're not really doing anything wrong with the actual removal, but anytime you happen to see frost shown here, frost shown here, this is a problem. This means the stopper is not holding tight and it's allowing excess liquid nitrogen to get out into the environment. And then the one that I really love is if you're worried about the stopper falling down into the tank, by all means, get a screw and put it into the stopper so that this plunger or this stopper doesn't fall all the way in the tank. Okay, this was actually from someone who's a very good technician, an excellent technician. It was just one of those things that, hey, I can live with it. But the reality is a stopper costs you less than 10 bucks, less than 10 bucks, and you have thousands of dollars worth of inventory in any uh, semen storage tank. So again, not a best management practice. Let's pay attention to, to what we really need to do. And then the last one I have here, you know, this is a broken neck and uh, there was still semen stored in it. Of course, they were losing a whole bunch of liquid nitrogen really quick, depending upon where the source of liquid nitrogen is and how much it costs. You know, you might be able to rationalize, well, I can fill it up every other day or something like this. Long-term, this is a mess. You don't want to do this, okay? Because you cannot control exactly that evaporation rate how fast will it go? And all of these tanks, any tank that you purchase has a rating on it. And it's rated to use liquid nitrogen so many centimeters or inches per day. So I have one tank that'll last me about eight weeks. I have another tank that'll last about 20 weeks, okay? So that's the type of information in an undamaged tank that is valuable. That's incredibly valuable. This is a wild card. You don't have any idea what's gonna to happen tomorrow. So bad news, please don't do that. Okay, one of the things we haven't talked about and we rarely talk about, but we should, is that liquid nitrogen is dangerous and we need to treat it as such. And we can burn our hands with it, certainly, okay? It can splash sometimes. So you've gotta be careful. This is not a burn from 
routine semen handling. This is actually a, a, a burn from going from a mother tank into a producer's tank and the nozzle got away. And at the time, the tech wasn't wearing gloves, okay? He healed up fine, no permanent damage, but you gotta be careful with what you're doing. Use your head. You wanna make sure if gloves are the thing you like, use gloves. And you can use everything from milkers gloves, nitrile gloves, to you know almost uh, athletic style gloves for the semen handling portion, and that's fine. I think that those are, those are good techniques to use. Okay, so we're gonna finish up, that finishes up the semen storage portion, and we're gonna go into the more semen handling portion, and then we're gonna get into a site of semen deposition. One thing that I always get a lot of questions on is this, this idea that of uh, what's the difference between a 0 0.5 ml straw and a 0 0.25 ml straw. And I'm showing two different ones here. The green one here is a 0.5 ml and the yellow one is 0.25. And as many of you know, uh, 0.5 is very common uh, by many studs. 0.25 on the other hand is marketed by other studs. Uh, sex semen tends to be processed in 0.25 uh, ml straws. But if we hold semen type constant, and let's look at conventional semen. So we're not talking about sex semen, we're talking about conventional semen. Jeff Stevenson from Kansas State in 2009 looked at a comparison of fertility data between cows that were inseminated with a 0.5 ml straw or a 0.25 ml straw, okay? There were almost 800,000 inseminations, right here, 780,000 inseminations. Jeff and his colleagues did mention there were large variation, there was large variation among the studies, but when all of these inseminations were analyzed in a common model, common statistical model. The 0.25 ml straw may provide an actual difference in pregnancy outcome of less than 1%. Okay, what does that mean? It means that they're essentially the same in a very large data set, essentially the same in fertility. And this goes against perhaps some marketing, but this is probably one of the largest studies I've ever seen where there's almost 800,000 inseminations. There are advantages on a very basic front, 2.5 as compared to 0.25. 0.5 is a little more forgiving for technicians that struggle with semen handling because you have larger amount of surface area, okay? 0.25, on the other hand, they're a little more sensitive for the opposite reason, okay? So that could be an issue. For some people like me, as you get older, it's harder to see, okay? I can read this straw very, very well whether it's on the slide or it's in my hand, there are some 0.25 straws that I struggle with, okay? You could say, yeah, you just need to stop, stop buying semen and let someone with good eyes do it. But the idea here is there's some advantages and disadvantages that are practical. But if we're gonna boil it down to, is there one that's magically more fertile? No, there's not, absolutely not. Is there one that might provide a little bit of a bump? Yes, and that's the results shown here. Okay, so we want AI cows. We wanna be ready for AI season. We wanna be ready for a particular day, let's say, if we're timed AIing a whole bunch of cows. What do we need? Obviously, we gotta have semen in the storage tank, okay? 
and we've got to have tweezers, a thaw box or multiple thaw boxes. We need to have an accurate thermometer, scissors, an AI gun or multiple AI guns, depending upon how many technicians or how many family members are breeding, disposable gloves, paper towels, and lubricant. And you can see all that stuff essentially here. This is like in a, in a truck toolbox that's been modified. Okay, we've got the liquid nitrogen storage tank here. We've got scissors. We've got tweezers, small bottles of lube. We've got um, small hand gloves here, uh, AI guns, shoulder sleeves, sheaths to go over the guns. Uh, this is another lube dispenser. And then over here, we've got the thaw baths, okay? What I always tell people as I'm teaching AI, this is, if, if there are any of you out there who like to have everything in its place and you like to work from left to right or right to left, this is the time that you can be in your glory. And I say that not joking with all honesty because I like to have things every time in the same place. Then I don't have to search for scissors. Then I don't have to say, well, what do you mean there aren't any sheets? Because if the sheets aren't where they are, I don't have any, and I should have noticed that earlier. So think about the setup before you get out there. It has to make sense to you, okay? And obviously, the technician who put this together, this is what makes this technician be able to excel at their job and to generate pregnancies. Okay. So one of the kind of sound bites that I want you to take away from this webinar is that every successful AI program begins with proper semen handling, okay? You've got the cows out there, you've got the heifers out there, and you've synchronized them or you've been checking heat. And that obviously is a huge portion of generating pregnancies. But on the other hand, we have to be able to access appropriately the semen straws, thaw them, load the gun, breed the cow to generate that pregnancy. And I want you to remember four things. There's time, temperature, hygiene, and skill, okay? Time, temperature, hygiene, and skill. And we're gonna talk more about those, but before I move on from this page, this is a gentleman who was breeding on a 3,000 cow dairy in California when I did some work with him. And he had a pull behind trailer behind his pickup truck, like a cargo trailer. And obviously he can stand up in it. But what I want you to take away from this is this made sense to him, okay? He's got the tank right here. He's also got inventory on the outside. It says whose semen is in there, whether it's the bull or the ranch, okay, or the dairy, okay? He's got his thaw baths here. He's got plenty of paper towels. There's no worrying about where the paper, paper towels are, okay? Scissors, tweezers, everything here. And look at the size of this clock. There's no wondering, has it been 45 seconds? Should I remove the straw? What time of day is it? How long have I been doing this? Et cetera, et cetera, okay? I didn't ask him anything. I showed up that day. I was gonna shadow him. I was talking to him about a research project. And I said, hey, can I come in and take some pictures? He says, yeah, sure. So I went in, none of this is staged. And that's what I want you to take home. You have to decide how that best fits in the scheme to generate pregnancies, okay? Okay, so we've got time, temperature, hygiene, and skill. First thing we're gonna talk about, or first couple things are time and temperature. We really need to understand that we can thaw half male semen straws appropriately, and we can hold them for 15 minutes at thaw temperature, which here's 35 degrees C or 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And after thawing, there's no difference. If we check right after thawing and then at 15 minutes, there's no difference in mean progressive sperm motility. So what we've done is we've maintained sperm motility. 
That's a good thing. That's what we want to do. No question about it. I want you to remember that number 15 also. On the other hand, if we're really not paying attention, and if we thaw seam inappropriately, but then we allow cooling to occur, okay, for 15 minutes, and then we take a endpoint motility reading, we'll see a decrease in mean progressive sperm motility. Okay, that's not what we want. We have not maintained sperm temperature. We want to always maintain sperm temperature. Okay, so this can be this can be a huge challenge. I lived in Minnesota. Okay, we bred cows when it was minus 35. We bred cows in December. Okay, I remember those days. We really had to think about how we were going to do this. We were fortunate in that we had cows that would come into a facility indoors. The chute would be right next to the office. We could either use a battery pack to keep the AI guns in to keep them warm, or we could put the gun inside our insulated Carhartt coveralls, walk as fast as possible out there and get that gun in the cow. Okay, so we've got to think how we're going to do this. Okay, so we want to thaw straws in 95 to 98 degree Fahrenheit water or 35 to 37 degree Celsius water for a minimum of 45 seconds. Okay, this is showing just two thaw boxes here. We've got a nice um, uh, thaw card. These work very well. You can see we're looking right in between 95 and 98 degrees right here, okay? Very important to take a therm another thermometer, a dial thermometer, and check periodically every couple of weeks, is this thermometer still working, okay? To make sure you are where you should be, okay? So we wanna thaw straws in warm water for 45 seconds. Hygiene is really important, okay? And the pictures that I've been showing you have not been staged. They've, they, these are from people who breed cows. They're actively breeding cows. Most of the pictures you've seen have been on dairies, okay? Uh, the previous technician, the gentleman from California, did not have manure all over, okay? Okay, this gentleman here has already been breeding cows at this facility and does not. Hygiene is very important. You want to make sure that you're focused. You know what you're doing. Notice there's no, there's no earbuds here, okay? He's not listening to something on the radio. He's focused on what's going on, okay? He gets the arm in the cow, not worried about manure in the, in the rectum, okay? Notice very short in the cow, up to the wrist approximately. Going to apply a little downward pressure with the arm that's in the cow, that causes the vulva to wink just a little bit. He's going to wipe the vulva with the paper towel. Most techs drop the paper towel, although there are a few that leave it in the bottom cleft of the vulva. And in one motion, he will remove the AI gun and it will go in the vagina in one motion. There's no waving it around. There's no, oh, no, I shouldn't have done that. Keep it in your coveralls. Keep it in the battery pack until you're ready. And when you're ready, with one fluid motion in the cow. Once it's in the cow, now you're in a safe zone. Okay? The cow starts to defecate. There's no problem. You can adjust your arm. You can adjust the, the gun to the right a little bit or to the left a little bit to avoid having manure uh, land on the gun, and once that episode's over, away you go, manipulate the cervix, breed the cow, and 35 days later, pat yourself on the back because you generated a pregnancy. So now we're going to talk about inseminator skill and deposition of semen. The goal is to go past the cervix 
when we are performing artificial insemination in cattle. From there, the goal should be deposition of semis, semen, as shown here, in the uterine body, in the uterine body. Notice that there is very little of the gun that has actually gone through or passed the cervix. And that's really the focus here. The focus is not to go in the right horn or the left horn. We can go this far, we can deposit the semen as shown here, and then sperm cells will make their way in the right horn and the left horn, okay? This takes a lot of practice initially, and it also takes a lot of checking by technicians who have a lot of experience. It's a good idea that once you feel the gun go all the way through, experience tech or not, that you use your index finger on the, pal on the palpating hand to make sure how far in am I? Where exactly is the tip? Oh yeah, oh yeah. I have very little of the tip. I've got a quarter of an inch or so in there to half an inch. Let's go. When the cow's still, breed the cow and away you go, okay? So another thing, kind of like the 0.5 ml versus the 0.25 ml, there's been this discussion for many, many years about, well, what happens if I just go closer to the site of ovulation and the site of fertilization? Wouldn't then I get maybe a bump in fertility? And many people have tried because if you go into the right horn or the left horn or both horns and split the dose, you are geographically closer to the site of fertilization, which is halfway between the uterine horn and essentially the ovary, okay? Or the infundibulum portion of the oviduct, okay? So there's been many research trials that have done this using a variety of different technician types, whether they're herdsmen inseminators or whether they're professional inseminators, whether they're from the US or they're from Ireland and UK, et cetera. And what we have here is we have, what is that seven? It looks like seven references, okay? All different kinds of studies. These are all, were all, I think they were all done in dairy. There might be some beef in here. The fertility response, if we were to compare cows that received insemination in the uterine body, with cows that received insemination like cows, similar cows, in the uterine horns, essentially, it's a wash. Some studies show there was a benefit. Some studies show, no, there's no benefit. One study, it depended upon who the AI tech was. Some AI techs actually got worse as they got closer to the site of fertilization, okay? So there is no consensus, and I've really struggled with this. I was taught uterine body, because then you can have potentially equal distribution of semen into the right and the left horn. It's much easier, and there's much less risk of injuring the cow because the horns curve and the horns curve down and we're using a metal implement in a live animal. So that's the way I teach AI. There is no consensus here. And also, I think we've really been asking kind of the wrong question. It's not whether it's, should we go in the uterine horns or uterine body? It's really, why is it this way? Why do we see this? I think it has to do with what's the effect if we actually deposit semen in the cervix? That's more important. That's more pressing. Because once you're past the cervix, you've passed the largest barrier that the animal has to sperm transport. The largest barrier. So getting past the cervix is the goal. But what would happen if we actually bred cows in the cervix? So there's a very elegant study way back 
in the 1960s where animals were palpated and those animals that had similar lengths, if you will, of reproductive tract relative to location of the cervix, um, specialized equipment was used to inseminate these animals. So they actually truncated or cut the AI guns so the technicians couldn't pass the cervix. And they told them, you're gonna use a short gun, put it in the cervix, okay? And then they compared that with uterine body depositions. And what they found was there was a 10% decrease in fertility when semen's deposited in the cervix as compared to when it's deposited in the uterine body. This is the bigger problem. This is the bigger issue. It's not going deeper. It's if we're, we don't get past the cervix, we take a bigger hit, okay? Here's the scary thing. There have been retraining workshops of technicians. And depending upon the data you look at and the age or the years of service, newer technicians who are coming back that don't have a lot of reps, cervical deposition of semen occurs in about 20% of attempted uterine body depositions. So this is a more pressing issue. This is really what I want you to think about when you're out there and you're breeding cows is, where am I? Do I know I'm past the cervix? Yes, I've checked, I'm past the cervix. Awesome, lift your finger, deposit, and out you go, okay? I do not recommend wasting time going forward into the uterine horns because there is no consensus in the literature that says it's a good practice. This is consensus here that's telling you it's a bad practice to deposit semen in the cervix. And with enough practice and repetitions, most people can pass most cows that they get into. Every now and then you get one that's a wild card, but uh, with experience, you'll be able to pass most of, most of them. Okay, so there was another research project which was done in the 1960s also by Ed Graham at the University of Minnesota. And what he did is he wanted to look at technicians that he classified as being average to maybe a little below average with technicians that were better than average. So they put some dye packs together inside AI guns and they asked these two groups of technicians to go ahead and breed cows. And then those cows back in the day, those cows, the research protocol would go to slaughter and then they would look at the reproductive tract and visually say, okay, here's where the dye was. Okay, so you know kind of how it was set up. And the fertility level of technicians, uh, in dairy, we used to use a term called non-return. Okay, and all non-return means is that an animal was inseminated, and then within approximately 30 to 60 days, she was not presented for AI again. Okay, so she did not return to estrus is the assumption. Okay, so that is an assumption that she was pregnant. And there are some issues with that, but we don't need to go into that. Essentially, this column are the, the average to below average technicians, less than 70% non-return rate in all the cows they've inseminated before they got to this retraining. And then we had those that were above average to good technicians, which were greater than 78% on a fertility basis is non-return. And then the numbers shown here is percentage placement, okay? And you can see right off the bat, if you just look to the left and look to the right, there's stark differences here. Those that have lower fertility levels actually struggle as a group to put a high percentage of the dye actually in the uterine body only 34% compared to 86%. Some went into the right horn, so they were through the cervix, through the uterine body into the right horn. And that was done also 
by this technician group. But look as we go down this column, somewhere in the left horn, there are some that were in the cervix, and this would be the cervix closest to the uterine body, excuse me, somewhere in the cervix closest to the vagina, that portion, the posterior, somewhere in the vagina. Some of the dye was put in the vagina, okay? That's scary. We really need to know where the tip of the gun is, where the tip of the gun is, and all other things being equal, the cow doesn't jump up and down, and we deposit appropriately, that's where the dye is gonna go, that's where the semen's gonna go, okay? But notice the, those technicians with higher fertility across many cows, they were in the uterine body or the right horn and not in any of these other sp spots. So it, it kind of makes logical sense. These ones can make it there, but they struggle a little bit. Therefore, their fertility is a little bit lower. These guys and women have it nailed down. Okay. For the most part, the train's running down the track and things are going well. Okay, so another really kind of big topic that always comes up when I'm teaching AI or when I'm talking with producers, whether it's beef or dairy, doesn't matter, is how many straws should I be able to thaw at one time? You know, Doc, I've got 100, 100 cows uh, synchronized or I've got 100 heifers synchronized and things have gone really well, the repro crew or the family or whoever, we got everything locked in. But you know, loading one gun at a time is just gonna kill us. We're not gonna be able to do it. What I always say is, if you wanna generate pregnancies, you can't break any rules. So you gotta think, how am I gonna manage my way out of this? Okay, and we're gonna talk more about that but I'm gonna answer this question first. We did a study in dairy cows uh, 16, 17 years ago on a variety of farms where we asked both professional technicians and herdsmen inseminators to thaw four straws of semen simultaneously, load four guns, one right after another, and go out, carry those four guns with you, go out and breed four cows. We asked them to use a stopwatch or their cell phone or to have a buddy or somebody time them also from when the first straw hit the thaw bath until the last cow was inseminated. Okay, so you have an idea of how, we're, how things are going here. We have in this graph here, sequential insemination number. All that means is number one is the first cow that was inseminated. Number two is the second, three is the third, fourth is the, four is the fourth, okay? Very good. On this axis, we have conception rate. This is by palpation, by a veterinarian who normally does this for these herds. Usually done on dairies somewhere between 35 and 42 days, okay? So what did we find out? We actually found out that if we look at the orange bars shown here, there was no effect on fertility whether the professional inseminators bred the first cow, the second cow, the third cow, or fourth cow in sequence. Notice the fertility is all around that 38 to, to 48 approximately. It's kind of in that range for dairy at this time was pretty common. Interestingly enough, herdsmen inseminators actually had lower fertility as a group, even though they worked on large dairies and they had a fair amount of repetitions, but there still was no difference in fertility between those animals that were inseminated with the first gun or those animals that were inseminated with the fourth gun, okay? There was a difference in average fertility between professionals and herdsmen, okay? But that's a story for another day. So I am not telling you to thaw four straws and go on your merry way. 
Absolutely not, because there's a component here we haven't talked about yet. Okay, there's a very important component here. I mentioned that we asked them to time themselves. Okay, we asked them to keep elapsed times. So what ended up happening is we have on this table, type of inseminator, professional, AI technician shown here, and we have herdsman inseminator shown here. We have the elapsed time to the completion of the first insemination and the fourth insemination. These numbers are actually completion times, okay? And yes, that means professional technicians in this study were able to thaw four straws, dry, load, cut, put sheaths on, and get to the first cow within four minutes. Get to the fourth cow within eight minutes. Herdsman inseminators were very close also, less than six minutes to complete the task for the first cow and less than 11 minutes to complete the task for the fourth cow, okay? Now, Jen, now granted, there are facilities differences between dairy and beef. Uh, we're talking about use of headlocks. We're talking about people who are thawing semen in the back of a truck usually or a trailer or they, uh, are working on an Odyssey or a Gator or whatever the ATV is that they particularly have, and they are really, really close to the cow. But if you are using a breeding barn or something like that, you can also do this type of thing because you have minimal amount of steps to the cows. The cows come to you, okay? So I asked you to remember that number 15 from previous slide where semen was thawed and then held at thawing temperature for 15 minutes. And they had done a motility at thaw right, right as soon as it was thawed and done a motility 15 minutes later and motility had been maintained. So that gives us our outside boundary. We know from research that we can maintain fertility based on motility, that's what was measured, by, look, by maintaining temperature for 15 minutes. On the other hand, we know that the bottom end is probably in that 10 minute range, you know, kind of the range is 10 to 15 minutes. We really probably shouldn't use more straws than we can breed cows within 10 to 15 minutes. Okay, so what do I mean by that? We're gonna to get to that at the very next slide. But for those of you that wanna see more data, we're talking thousands of inseminations here. This is summarized by Mel DeJarnett from Select Sires, okay? This is also dairy animals. They were not asked to thaw four straws sequentially. This is from a larger study that had five, six, seven, eight straws uh, thawed sequentially. But the problem is, the number of straws was much, much lower. And then it, because it becomes unbalanced and it becomes kind of a mess to interpret, okay? Looking at these four straws, fertility in dairy cattle with thousands of inseminations is very similar, okay? So likely these occurred within that 10 to 15 minutes time period. So we're going back to the original question. How many straws should I thaw at one time? I got 100 cows. Doc, you're not telling me the answer. I got 100 cows. I got to breed, and I've got other things to do. Okay? I'm not going to tell you the answer you want. You can't break all the rules. You won't generate pregnancies. Thaw no more than can be used in 10 to 15 minutes. No more than can be used in 10 to 15 minutes. For me, that might be two. I'm not real fast loading guns. There might be someone else that is just lightning quick loading guns, okay? It's important to know your comfort zone. It's important to say, you know what? I can't carry six guns. 
I can't, you know, you can't just load guns and leave them on the table and I'll come back and get them because it takes me two and a half minutes each cow or something or three minutes each cow. Okay, know your comfort zone, be honest. When you are thawing multiple straws, do not allow the straws to touch when they're thawing in the thaw bath. Well, what do I mean by that? I've, I took three straws out of the top goblet of the bull Bubba. Why wouldn't I just drop them in the, in the thaw bath and thaw them? My recommendation is, even though they're from the same sire and they were in the same goblet, they were frozen. What you want to do is take those three, let's say it's three, and right above the thaw bath, right when they go in, you want to twist them so that they actually separate and they circle around the thaw bath. And the idea there is you don't want straws to touch, get apart, and then touch again because we know that causes damage to sperm cells. Once it goes in the thaw bath, you want them to be separate. Some people actually use the thermometer as a divider and they'll put one straw on one side, one straw on another if they're comfortable and they know they can get cows pregnant doing that, okay? Use multiple thaw baths, okay? A thaw bath costs a whole lot less than open cows, a whole lot less than open cows. Remember time, temperature, hygiene, and skill. Okay, we haven't answered the question about I got a hundred cows to breed. I got a hundred heifers that I have synced up. I use the, the BRTF protocol sheet, might've gotten it out of the back of an AI catalog or on the website. And these animals are ready. I'm gonna breed them on Thursday. Okay, well, before Thursday, how am I gonna do this? You've gotta think about it. You've gotta think about just like you purchased all the semen and all the semen's in the tank, and essentially you've mated the cows, you know which cow's gonna be bred to which, which sire to generate the desired offspring. You gotta think about who's gonna thaw the semen, okay? This is a great spot to work in tandem with other technicians, to work with other family members. Hey, you're gonna breed the first 10 cows, I'm going to sit here and just load, load guns. And as we get going, I'm going to make sure that I haven't loaded too many guns and they're just sitting out here not being protected. And as you get to know each other from one breeding season to another, you can do that boom, 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 lickety split, no problem because it's like your right hand is breeding the cow. Someone else is doing it, but you become very in tune with that. But you've got to have the right person that'll be able to thaw and do that for you. And then you can switch places, someone else, you do it for someone else. That also allows for those of you that don't have a lot of experience breeding a lot of cows on any one day, that reduces inseminator fatigue by doing 10 cows at a time or 15 cows at a time and then rotating, okay? Again, just because you have a lot of cows to breed doesn't mean you can break any rules, you can't. And if you do, you're gonna be unhappy with the results because you won't generate as many pregnancies as you should have and as really that, that you need for the business. Okay, one slide on sex semen because sex semen is a different product. It's not the same as conventional semen, okay, obviously. It has been highly processed. There have been improvements, no question, there have been improvements to the processing of sex semen since it was uh, released in 2006, okay? And now there are multiple sex semen products on the market. Having said that, Sex semen is not conventional semen, and it does not act exactly as conventional semen does because it has been highly processed. So the idea here is to recognize that 
And the idea is to shorten that 10 to 15 minute interval and bring it back to a five to eight minute interval is what I'm really most comfortable with, okay? Why do I say that? This is some research that was done with a, a common product that was available at the time. And essentially, straws of semen were thawed and then they were maintained at, at uh, different levels. So this green line is it was thawed and then it was maintained at that level. Okay, it's 98.6 is where they thought it, which is fine. Uh, it's 95 to 98 degrees, okay? Just a little out on the outside. And you can see there's very little decline in motility here. There's very little, okay? It's essentially maintained. If we heat shock semen after thawing it appropriately, that line is shown here and fertility declines, excuse me, motility declines, and we would expect fertility to decline. And then on this one, the red line, which is shown here, it's thawed appropriately, and then it's cold shock is applied, and you have a more distinct decrease of motility. So the idea here is, it's not a conventional product. It's a good product, but highly processed. Let's move away from the outer boundary back to the left where we have less of a chance of a sharp, sharp decline if we are, number one, doing things appropriately or if something happens to go wrong and we don't, we don't actually recognize it okay, because the spread is much less over here than over here, obviously, okay? So just something to think about, something to think about. Okay, so we're going to summarize everything. That's one thing I haven't done. I've taken big chunks or big ideas, and we've talked about that, but we're going to summarize the whole process now because that's really where everyone needs to, to kind of understand how everything we talked about fits, okay? The first thing that anyone needs to do is maintain an accurate semen inventory. And you maintain the accurate semen inventory on the outside of the tank. So you don't have to look in the tank and say, where is Traveler? Where is Bubba? It's on your phone, it's on a laptop, it's on a chart on the wall, How, whatever makes sense to you. I know exactly where it is. Canister eight, I have four canes of Bubba. You didn't even, didn't even have to open the tank. You're ready to go, okay? There's no nitrogen going all over. So that's really, really important, okay? Seems like a no-brainer, but you've got to restrain the animal before you start this process. And we're talking about the animal or animals that's going to receive AI, okay? We could all probably tell stories about the time the animal got loose and we had the gun in our pants and we're chasing the animal around the barnyard, okay? We gotta manage our way around that. We gotta make sure the animal is appropriately restrained, not only for her health and welfare, but for ours and also for the management task, okay? And we do that ahead of time. Locate all the necessary items. Okay, like I said before, this is the time if you like to do things left to right, clockwise, counterclockwise, doesn't matter. Set it up the way it makes sense to you. Make sure you have everything and go through one in your head before you actually do it. Even when I teach AI, I go through in my head and I tell people, right now I'm visualizing, I'm taking a straw out. The straw is going to come from canister one. It goes in the thaw bath. 45 seconds later, I remove it and so on. And by doing that, when you get to the part about I have to cut the straw, you're mentally going through it. There's no scissors. Well, since I'm mentally doing a dry run, no problem. Okay, I got to find the scissors. 
So I find the scissors, I put them where they should belong and away I go. Now I've got everything I need. Really important. Check the water bath temperature. Never assume that because it's plugged into the wall in the office or it's plugged into the breeding barn outlet or it's plugged into the, the trailer lights on the, on the trailer, whatever. Never assume the water bath is at the appropriate temperature, okay? I've gone, worked with technicians and said, hey, do you mind if I use a, a thermometer and check out what the, what the temperature of your thaw bath is? No, 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 yeah, no problem, go ahead. Go out there. Many of them are right on. There's no issues. Every now and then I go into one, it's like, whoa, wait a minute. And then I'll tell the tech when they come back and they're like, what do you mean it's wrong? And then we'll find the wire has wiggled loose. Okay, so really important. Check the water bath temperature, know what it is. Using tweezers, work below the frost line to remove the straw from the tank. Okay, when you're working on the bottom goblet, that would be the lower one on the cane. It's actually really easy. You can use the tweezers if you want to remove that top goblet. And then you do have the ability to raise the cane a little bit higher, but you're still gonna keep that bottom goblet below the frost line. And you can still use the tweezers, pull that straw out or however many you need and away you go, okay? Thaw semen in warm water, 95 to 98 degrees Fahrenheit, 35 to 37 degrees Celsius for 45 seconds, okay? A story I like to tell is I worked in uh, the Philippines doing an AI school many years ago, and there were technicians who would tell stories about not having access to warm water. And they knew everyone that they were breeding cows for essentially had a fire and the fire was for cooking or for heating, for baking. So they could bring water with them. They could have a thaw bath with them. They could heat up the water, get it, mix it at the appropriate temperature, put it in the thaw bath, double check it, no electricity, thaw the semen appropriately, inseminate the cow. Incredibly valuable because this one cow is the only cow that these poor families owned. Yet there's no electricity, okay? Doesn't matter, figure it out. We can all figure that out, okay? You remove the straw from the thaw bath and you wanna dry it thoroughly with a paper towel, okay? We don't wanna have water come in contact with sperm cells, okay? It leads to damage and death. So we don't want that to happen. So dry that straw off very well and you're good. Load the straw into the gun and you always cut the sealed end or the crimped end, the pinched end, whatever you wanna call it. That's the end you cut and cut that end off. Pull a sheath over that gun and straw assembly and secure the sheath. Make sure you're using the appropriate sheath for the appropriate gun. Okay, and your semen supplier can help you with that. Place that assembled gun close to your body to maintain temperature, okay? Year round, year round, get used to that. I'm walking 10 feet from where we're thawing to go into the breeding barn or however we do it at your place. And this is just protocol. Get it in, I get in the cow, it comes out in one motion and goes in the cow. You're in the safe zone because you got the gun in the cow. Okay, you've maintained temperature. Pull on a sleeve, of course, get lube, uh, bring paper towels with you, etc. Okay, obviously you're putting palpating hand into the rectum and then you're gonna wanna wipe the vulva clean, okay? Don't be a fanatic about wiping 10 times. A couple of times will do and move on with the process. Insert the gun into the vagina in one motion, as I've mentioned many times. Manipulate the cervix, 
okay? Manipulate the cervix once the gun is at the cervix. If we don't push the gun through the cervix necessarily, we actually manipulate the cervix on the gun while applying very gentle forward pressure. And I chose my words very carefully. Very gentle forward pressure. Again, we have a metal implement in a live animal. And what we want to do is generate pregnancies. And the way to do that is to be as calm as possible and to take it easy, recognize where we are, and adjust if we need to. Adjust. Bring the gun back a little bit if you're having trouble and manipulate the cervix up, down, left, right, forward, back. I get through the first ring, awesome. Now the, the, the combination is going to be different for the second ring. It could be I have to bring it, bring the cervix to the left. So you manipulate your palpating hand to the left, you get past the second ring. Okay, what's the combination for the, the third ring? I might have to bring it down a little bit. I'm through now. Check with your index finger. Okay, again, manipulating the cervix rather than this idea of pushing the gun through the cervix. Okay, keep accurate records. Okay, you're breeding five cows or you're breeding 100 cows like we've talked about. Please keep accurate records. Date of AI, the cow number, the sire number, the tech ID. You know, if there's two Joes breeding, Joe D and Joe A or whoever. So that way you can kind of keep track across time, not for punishment, but to understand how the process worked, how many cows were bred, how many cows actually were the, this sire did we use, how many uh, became pregnant, all these types of things, okay? We need the data to actually analyze that. And then it's always a good idea, I think, to write down in the record, hey, this animal was bred after heat. She was observed in heat. Or we had a timed AI protocol. And you can just put timed AI. And that way you can go back at any time and you can look and say, you know, that really worked out. We had a great breeding season. We generated a whole bunch of pregnancies early using AI. And this is something we want to do again. Or if things didn't work out so well, then you can work with semen supplier with university extension or researchers, veterinarian, to try and figure out what's going on. And you actually have data to show. And you can say, well, here's what I did. You know, kind of, can you help me out? And that's the value of those accurate records. Got a pregnancy and open check all animals, of course, at the end of the breeding season, which animals am I going to keep? Open animals are really expensive to keep, obviously, across to the next breeding season. Uh, really important to know, uh, were these animals pregnant to AI? Were they pregnant to the cleanup bulls, et cetera? So you want to preg and open check all your animals. Again, we're rounding the corner, we're going for home. I want you to remember this idea of time, temperature, hygiene, and skill, okay? That's a take home from this. There's a lot that goes into each one. But if you can remember those four things, hopefully then that'll spark something, give you something to chew on and think about, you know, how do we do this here? How do we do this? If you're doing it, great. And fertility's great. Keep going. Don't change. But if you think, well, maybe we could change a little bit, think about it. Talk with it. Talk about it with someone. Okay, facilities. Facilities can be an issue. No question about it. No question about it. I recognize that. You know, I work a fair amount with dairy producers where facilities don't tend to be as much of an issue because certainly in the West, we have a whole bunch of headlocks, okay? In the East, there's more palpation rails. I worked on a dairy when I was in Virginia where we bred cows in the milking parlor, okay? Not optimal, but we did it, okay? So do you need a breeding barn? Do you need access to a portable breeding barn, but you can't afford one? You can't get one, okay? Ask your local semen supplier. Ask University Extension. I was on the internet earlier today. There's units all over the US that are available for rent. I personally know techs in the area that have their own breeding barns 
that they'd be happy to come out, AI your cows or work with you to synchronize AI and also use their breeding barn and their panels or their gates, okay? So that helps out there, okay? What are some of the rents? I saw today anywhere from 50 to $150 a day, okay? Uh, so it can be very little when you talk about what the value of those calves, AI sired calves are to your business and how many you're actually going to generate, okay? So you kind of have to do that math. But in reality, I'd argue there's a lot of value in, in paying the hundred bucks if it averages a hundred bucks for a breeding barn to rent it. That's all I have, okay? I thank you very much for, for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm gonna turn it back over to Vitor because I'm not aware of the time and all that kind of stuff. And then, like I said, I'll answer questions if I can. That was great, Joe. Um, we already received several um, comments here saying how, how good of a refresher it was. You know, we tend to just overlook a lot of the semen handling, right? We try to focus on the technique, actually getting the cow bred. So this is really good. Um, there are a couple of questions here that are um, very similar. So I um, wanted to comment on throwing semen inside the cow or in the pocket, uh, the shirt pocket. Okay, very good. Excellent, excellent question. So we're going to talk about um, pocket thawing first, and then I'll talk about semen hand, or excuse me, thawing in the cow, okay? Pocket thawing does work. I wanna be clear about that. But, and there's a big but here, you have to listen to this. Pocket thawing only works in semen that is processed for pocket thawing. Okay, what do I mean by that? If I buy semen from stud A, and in all of their materials, online uh, printed materials, it says semen is appropriate for pocket thawing, then I'm good to go. Okay, I have to follow their pocket thawing rules, but I'm good to go. On the other hand, if I go to AI stud B and I'm looking at the catalog in paper, or I'm looking online, or I'm talking with the tech, and they say, we want you to use warm water thaw, 95 to 98 degrees. End of discussion. The semen is processed for warm water thaw. And it has to do with how the thawing actually occurs, okay? Pocket thawing, it occurs in a different manner, if you will, than warm water thaw because of the change in temperature meaning we're going from frozen at minus 300 degrees, let's say, to 98 degrees Fahrenheit in a thaw bath. Whereas in a pocket thaw situation, the thaw would likely occur going from minus 300 into your pocket, which may not be as warm as 98 degrees initially. So thaw rate is different, okay? Again, thawing in the pocket does work. However, only for semen processed for pocket thawing. All other semen can be, pro can be thawed using warm water. Now, is the reverse true? Can you use warm water for semen that is recommended for pocket thaw? Yes, you can, but it's easiest to use what the manufacturer recommends. Okay, we've answered Perfect. that. The next one is, what about you put it in the cow? Okay, because the cow's 102 degrees, you know, it's gonna thaw, okay? You don't get uniform thawing. And what you get is you get a whole bunch of damaged sperm and a whole bunch of dead sperm and really low or no fertility. Okay, 
because the, uh, the whole idea with the straw and how the straw was designed describes optimal survivability of sperm. And that's why the straw looks like it does. As opposed to those of you that are at least my age or older, remember the little glass ampules. Little glass ampules had a totally different surface to volume ratio totally different that was not optimized for fertility like we have with straws. It worked, but it wasn't optimized. But the surface to volume ratio of straws is not optimal for thawing in the cow because you don't get a uniform thaw and you will get ice crystals that will damage sperm as they are thawing. And then you got a mess on your hands and you don't have a pregnant cow. Okay. Perfect. Um, uh, the first question that came up actually during the, the webinar is that, is there any difference in temperature maintenance of the semen that's inside the goblet? And sometimes that they, they get liquid nitrogen inside of them. Is there any difference in temperature of those that have the, you know, capture liquid nitrogen inside or not? Okay. Yes, there is a temperature difference. Ideally, we like to have liquid nitrogen in the goblets, top and bottom, ideally. And that if we look at the way the tanks are constructed and where the canisters hang and liquid nitrogen levels, et cetera, that's the ideal situation, okay? So yes, there is a temperature difference. However, as the liquid nitrogen level goes down in the tank, okay, there still is an appropriate temperature zone for those upper goblets, okay? Now, the issue then becomes, which is something totally different, is how often we open the tank and we raise and drop the cane. That wreaks havoc on liquid nitrogen level and the amount of safety, let's say, we have. But in general, we would like to have as much liquid nitrogen in the tank and in both goblets because it is better for uh, the sperm cells. Yes. Awesome. Um, the two questions about uh, your recommendation uh, of hygiene of the paw baths. You know, so how often do you change the water and clean those, uh, the paw baths, as well as the gun warmers, you know, those um, electronic gun warmers? Excellent. Thaw baths, you know, those need to be done regularly. It's going to depend on how many, you know, how many cows you're breeding across how many days, weeks, or months. Um, you know, when, again, when I was working on small dairies, we used to use a little tiny thermos that you would put coffee in or soup in, and you just put water in it, and then you throw the water out when you're done breeding the however many cows. So it's not a big deal. But one that's always plugged into the wall I'd say you have to, you have, you've got to clean them at least weekly, okay? It's not a big deal. You dump them out. You kind of look around, see anything growing in there, nothing growing in there. You can leave it actually without water for a while till the next day and then load water in it also. That, you could certainly do that. Now the battery packs. Okay, battery packs are a different story. You want to make sure that those are cleaned after every use. And by use, I mean every day. Okay, because what we have is we have guns that are going down into the battery pack and the battery pack is 98 degrees roughly, but we have organic material, the extender portion of the semen, uh, of, the, of, the, of the extended semen, some might, you might get a droplet in there and you might get another droplet, okay? Not enough to worry about but you have constant temperature, which then bacteria love, and then bacteria will grow. So you wanna clean them out daily, number one, or some people put an AI glove in them, and then you put the guns in the AI glove, which is inside the battery pack, and at the end of the day, you pull the AI glove out and throw it out, and then you don't have any problem with the battery pack, it's not dirty. Um, there's a, 
interesting question from uh, Salo, who I know was one of your students. So um, what is the best way to load the Siemens straw? Do you put the Siemens straw inside the gun, then the sheath, or you put the straw in the sheath and then load the sheath into the gun? Okay, okay, very good. So I was going to say I'm not going to answer any questions from Salo, but that wouldn't <laughs> So I will go ahead. No, uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Salo, for the question, because there are two, two kind of groups. To me, it does not matter. And I don't think there's many people that it matters to how you do it. What matters is ask yourself, am I breaking any rules? So when I have the gun and I have kept the gun warm while I'm thawing the semen, okay? The gun is warm, it's in my coveralls and it's unassembled. I dry the straw off, it's all dry. I put the straw in a warm gun, okay? And then I cut and I put the sheath on, I put it back in my coveralls and I'm ready to go. If you wanna do it the other way, what you would have to do is you'd have to have the gun warm and the sheath warm, and then you remove the straw, dry it off, cut it off, flip it over, and shoot it down the sheath, and that goes down the sheath, and it's protected by your coveralls. Then you take the gun, which is warm, and you mate it with the sheath, and away you go. By doing it in either way, you've broken no rules. If you hold the sheath kind of out here and you want to attach the, the straw to the gun, now you're getting to the, or the, the straw to the sheath, now you're getting into a little more of a gray area. So that would be my answer. You can do it both ways. Which way is best? The best way is the way you generate the most pregnancies. Um. A, a lot of questions about um, using the plastic sheaths, the protecting sheaths on top of the plastic sheaths already. Uh, there's some, you know, soft plastic ones. There's some hard plastic ones. Um, is it worth using? Do that improve fertility uh, or not? Can you comment on that? Another very, very good question. There are some research studies that show some benefits to fertility. But unfortunately, the benefits to fertility are not universal across all types of cows. And it was done primarily in dairy cows again. And for example, the result was different for first lactation animals uh, compared to second or third lactation animals, little older animals. Okay. The idea, of course, is, is that we're gonna take this unit that has a secondary sheath on it. And we're going to bring that out of the coveralls, put it into the cow. And once we get to the cervix, we pop through it. And then the gun with the sheath, that whole unit essentially is clean. And then that will go through the cervix. There's nothing wrong with the mechanics of that. The mechanics have been shown, whether it's a, a, a little bit harder plastic or the little flimsy plastic, the mechanics work, no question. The question is, can you measure a response in the amount number of cows that you do? And why do you think you might need it, is the thing. Cows have normal bacteria within the vagina. There's normal bacteria within the cervix, okay? If the gun's clean and the sheath is clean and your coveralls don't have who knows what on them, then in general, most cows should be able to take a gun with just a sheath. But again, there is some research that shows some differences, but it's not universal. Great. Um, there are three questions that are, in, this, in essence, talking about um, those studies about you know the 15 minutes um, time limit, and also the amount of cows that you can breed, you know, 
thinking about the succession breeding you know, loading and uh, pawing a bunch of semen at the same time, right? So the first one is um, um, whether that 15 minute time limit is to get the gun inside the cow or actually finish breeding the cow. Um, and if you leave, you know, how quickly after, if you leave the, the semen inside the thaw bath and the gun warmer, um, how quickly after those 15 minutes, you really start seeing um, say, you know, sperm mortality and decreasing fertility. Right. Okay. So the first part of the question is kind of where that 15 minute is relative to being an end point. Where's kind of the end point? I would argue 15 minutes is completion. So 15 minutes is deposition in your last cow. That's really the easiest way to adhere strict to the rule is I'm only going to breed as many, or I'm only going to thaw as many guns or draws and load as many guns as I can complete in 15 minutes. Complete. So that's the way I look at it. Now, some people could argue, well, but you're in the cow, that last one, you know, the temperature's at the, at the appropriate point and on and on and on. But still, then that starts bringing stuff out to 20 minutes, 25 minutes, et cetera. And we wanna get the semen out of the straw and in the cow. And we have research that I showed up to 15 minutes. We don't have research maintenance that I've seen recently that's you know 35 minutes or 45 minutes in like a breeding situation. So it's easier for me to segment it and say 15 minutes in the cow. Okay. Then um, got to remind me about the second part, Vitor. Um, how quickly after those 15 minutes inside the thaw bath is semen oh. really dying, sperm really dying, and fertility decreasing? Okay, okay. You know, I don't know, and that's a good question, from 15 to 30 minutes, let's say, or from 15 to 45 minutes. I don't know how it drops off the cliff there, okay? I'd have to go back and look. There's certainly some historical data that I could look at um, as far as maintenance of motility uh, in a laboratory situation across time. But in a practical sense, the data that I've seen in that kind of 15 minute range is, is, is one that I'm comfortable with, is more uh, of a functional kind of standpoint. It's kind of also, I don't know if anyone asked it, but it's kind of also, well, what happens if I thaw semen and I only load one gun and then I go and breed the cow and come back and take the straw out of the thaw bath, dry it off, load that, and then go breed the second cow. So essentially you thawed semen and stored it in the thaw bath, okay? I would not recommend that either. Even if, even if it's within the time zone, I wouldn't recommend that. It's best to go from one step to another to another and complete it, okay? Because the potential is two things. First potential is you could be at the first cow and something goes totally wrong. Totally wrong. You got a straw hanging out in the thaw bath now, okay? It could take you forever to breed this cow. She could run away, whatever. On the other hand, we know that when we thaw semen, especially multiple straws, the temperature of the water bath actually declines. We know this. We know this from data, not only in the US, from data in Brazil, where you're breeding lots of cattle, okay? 100 cows, 150 cows, okay? And if you thaw a whole bunch of straws, three, four, five, ten 10 straws at a time, thaw bath temperature goes down. If you choose to leave those straws in the thaw bath, now you've left them in a suboptimal environment. So that's kind of why, you know, the data that I've seen, that's kind of why I, I'm more hard and fast. Put it in the thaw bath, thaw it, load those guns and go breed those cows. Um, there's a question about changing gloves between cows. Um, I'm not sure if it's related to one of the studies you show or if you just a recommendation. Would you recommend doing that? Um, uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. Um, 
It's probably not a practice that is adhered to very often by breeders who breed numerous cows in succession. Okay, that's, that's the reality. On the other hand, uh, bovine leukosis is also a reality and can be transmitted from cow to cow. So it, this is one of those balancing acts. It's one of those things of risk management. It's one of those things of kind of the comfort zone. Um, uh, there are many that carry numerous gloves with them and they have, they have four gloves and four guns and away they go, okay? There are, of course, palpators, veterinarians who will use the same glove for a pen of cows and then change, okay? So you need to know the risks um, and know the, the health level of, of the herd you're working in. Um, I'm not giving you a hard and fast answer because there's different practices out there. Oh, that's perfect. Um, the last question we have here, uh, Joe, it's almost like a recommendation. So it's somebody that's a beginner uh, on AI and is looking to buy some equipment. So if you could comment on things to buy uh, and um, you know, things that are going to be durable, economical, and also, you know, you know, it works. So you could give a couple of recommendations. Okay, excellent. Excellent. Even, yes. I guess you could um, talk about brands, but you know, leave that up to you. Yeah, no, no, that's, it's a great question because I had to buy equipment at one time when I came here for this job and how did I think about it and all those types of things. That's excellent, okay? You can talk to semen reps, okay? You can talk to the local, local semen reps from whichever stud that is in your, in your area or who works with your neighbors or your cousins or whoever. That's a great resource and they will have a variety of products that are available, whether they're guns or sheaths, um, whether they're AI gloves, uh, access to lube. Um, they, many of the AI studs also have marketing agreements with makers of the liquid nitrogen tanks. So you can essentially kind of do a one-stop shop and say, I, I wanna AI my cows this season and I'm gonna need A, B, C, D, and E. You know, what, what do you have? Okay, so that's the way I would do it. Um, you can look on the internet also. Uh, there are uh, sales, uh, internet, uh, whether they're ranches that resell. There are some very, very large ranches in Nebraska and uh, uh, Texas that will resell brand new tanks. They'll sell AI equipment. They do custom AI, all those types of things. You can go to something like eNASCO. So NASCO, the agricultural supplier, uh, you can enasco.com, things like that. The basics that you're gonna need, you're gonna need a liquid nitrogen tank. Liquid nitrogen tank, uh, a, a reasonably sized one that holds hundreds of units of semen that, you, that will last maybe 20 weeks or so. Liquid nitrogen, six to $700 usually is the purchase price in that range, okay? An AI gun, brand new AI gun, costs maybe 25 to $35. Uh, sheaths for a pack of 50 cost $3.50. Um, lube is very inexpensive. Uh, gloves for a box of, what is it? A box of 200, you can get them for 10 bucks, um, something like that. So those types of things, are readily available, but I would start with the semen supplier because you're gonna to need to buy the semen. You're gonna to need to have a relationship with them. Um, you can also, if you wanted to, kind of check stuff out on the internet um, and do that. Also talk with family and friends and see, hey, do you like the tank that you're using? Um, when I learned, I learned on an AI gun that has something called an O-ring or a donut, Okay, that shows how old I am. My kids would say, well, you're a dinosaur. On the other hand, now all the guns don't use O-rings. Now they use something called a spiral, okay, or a wedge. And those are so easy to use. Those are so nice. So you want to make sure that you listen to kind of the recommendations. And those really work well. They're newer and they work really, really well. So that's kind of how I would go. 
Yeah. Um, you know, most, most semen companies, they will have a kit ready to go, right? They'll sell you the whole kit that has the top box, the AI guns exactly. and you know, the sheets and everything else. So exactly. Um, and if this is, if this is something that is going to be done kind of in a remote, remote, meaning there's not a building and there's not electricity or there's minimal electricity, you know, you want to make sure that that thaw bath can work off your truck or some sort of uh, battery pack or something so that when you're set up by the corral, which is actually away from the farm or the office, et cetera, you're ready to go. And uh, there are many people, you know, back, we used to call them cigarette lighters, but they're the accessory uh, implement in your car or truck. You just buy just like it's plugging in a, a cell phone charger. You can plug your AI uh, thaw unit in and away you go, you thaw in the, in your truck. So yeah. Exactly. Joe, I think that wraps, wraps it up. Um, thank you very much again. Great talk. Uh, appreciate you spending the time with us. Uh, I want to remind everyone that this was recorded and it will be posted on our YouTube channel uh, by tomorrow. So please make sure to go there and subscribe so you can keep up with all our webinars and also follow us on social media. And we'll see and, you next month, Joe. And my email is on this last slide. So anyone is welcome to shoot me an email if you have questions. Yes, and um, good reminder that in our website, beefreaper.org, we have our ask the expert um, function there. So you can send us questions and uh, we'll, we'll make sure to answer them. So thank you very much. Have a good night and we'll see you next month.